Today we have Emily uh, presenting uh, and I'm going to use the lovely title that she has on the screen, Poo and Pee. Um, I have uh, set up um, a quick evaluation in Slido and I will post the link up and if you could all quickly fill it out, it takes about 30 seconds. Um, if you have any questions, uh, don't forget you can type them into the chat box or um, alternately just put your hand up. You can select that in the reactions and, and just say your question. That would be great. Um, I think that's uh, about all. Um, I actually didn't find out. Georgia, are you the GP lead today? Um, I'm in Victoria at the moment, so it depends on how good my internet is, but I'll, I'll monitor the chat box. <laughs> okay, that'd be yep. great. Yep. All right, well, we might get started then. Thanks, Emily. Well, so welcome. Thanks, Jenny, for that intro. Um, so, who and P, so something we do uh, pretty much every day, uh, hopefully every day. Um, very common, uh, but lots of us uh, unfortunately have uh, lots of difficulties with this um, quote unquote natural um, function of the body. So that's why we're here today um, and we're focusing on kids, uh, hence trying to keep it a bit fun um, and the title. So to kick us off and really focus us in on our audience, um, why did the toilet paper fail to cross the road? Really important question. Um, and because I can't see chat and it's the first thing, I might just skip to the answers, which is because it was stuck in a crack. Um, and it's hard because I can't hear anyone laughing or not laughing. So I'm not sure the audience reaction, uh, but we'll gay, jump onto the next one, which is what are surfers greatly afraid of? And sharts is the answer. So for those of you not sure, that's a poop and a fart. Um, and I think that hopefully grounds us uh, in the topic and the audience um, that this content is for. So what are we covering today? So we're looking at abnormal defecation first off because it impacts on a lot of the um, things that, that are to follow in the discussion, which is daytime leaking and nighttime leaking or wetting. So we'll go through a brief history exam for all these topics. We'll look at common causes, red flags, when to refer um, and management options as well. So learning objectives. Um, I thought about this and I thought, well, our audience is potentially medical students uh, registrars, new GPs and GPs that have been doing this for many more years than I have. So I think learning objectives to everyone is I would love all of us to have one thing or come away with at least one thing from this this hour together uh, that we remember in the months to come or even years to come. So let's dive right in. So chronic constipation. So depending on what article you read, it's either really common, 30% uh, or not so common, 3%. Uh, but I would argue that it is quite common uh, right throughout life. So for exam criteria, um, exam purposes rather, Rome 4 criteria is the one we're looking at for childhood functional constipation, which is that constipation that's more behavioural or doesn't have an organic cause necessarily. So academically speaking, it's two or more of the following per week for a month in infants and two months in older kids. So that's passing emotion less than or equal to two times a week. Uh, excessive retention of stools, uh, hard or painful defecation, presence of a large faecal mass in the rectum. And this is my reminder to tell everyone, don't DRE. Um, even the specialists uh, very rarely DRE kids, so um, you have to have incredibly good reason to do so. So, uh, again, this is an academic presence of large faecal mass in the rectum or something you might find on investigation, but I wouldn't be examining for it. Uh, history of large diameter bulky stools. Uh, and again, Emily, what does that mean? That means the poos that block the toilet. So the ones that don't flush down, the ones that when someone flushes, it just, you need to get the plunger or the stick or whatever it is in your family for whoever it is in your family to help it go down. Uh, more than one episode a week of soiling after toilet training without another common cause. Um, so that's academically speaking and for exams. Uh, I think there's lots of other ways that kids present and we don't necessarily go through this criteria in GP before we start management or talk about causes, um, but it's good to have a refresher. So what are the precipitants for this behavioural non-organic uh, cause for constipation? So it really is that sort of change in environment uh, stresses, so change in behaviours, stool holding, 
uh, avoidance of going to the toilet, things are more fun, um, things are happening, um, change in food, so changing the consistency of the stool itself or fishes potentially causing painful stooling and then sort of setting up that really painful, annoying cycle of poo and pain and, and avoidance. So what are some of our red flags? So some of our more organic causes potentially. Um, and I put the yellow flags because um, one of these, as you can see, is, is I think, you know, it has a potential to be either a red flag or, or something that's a bit um, sit up and pay attention, but not necessarily um, immediately significantly concerning. So that's what I mean by yellow in this situation. Um, so some of those red flags uh, that suggest other, under, other underlying pathology. Uh, would be fairly past meconium uh, or the first stool in the less than 48 hours and some articles say 24 hours and that's what I've previously gone on. Um, so that can indicate Hirschsprungs. Uh, onset of constipation really early in life um, can link to a number of organic causes. Stool consistency, um, so if it's changing, so it's becoming that ribbon um, type in adults or pencil thin stools, we're thinking more of like a, a growth around the rectum that's thinning out those stools. And in kids, if it's congenital, we're thinking about a malformation. Uh, bloody diarrhea, so there's lots of different common causes for it. Uh, you can have a one-off episode, a couple of episodes, but some of the common things that can cause it is uh, looking for infections, inflammatory bowel disease, <clears throat> cow's milk protein allergy, uh, or soy milk protein allergy as well, can present with bloody diarrhea and bloody stools and constipation. So really common cause and important to look for. Uh, developmental delay can cause it as well. Um, and that would be uh, potentially more of a behavioural cause uh, and lots of other factors. And then not forgetting our spinal pathology, uh, lower limb uh, neurologic, neurological causes uh, linked with those lower, lower nerves uh, and other symptoms of a more systemic uh, cause such as infection or obstruction. So uh, red flags aside, what are the other common organic causes we should be thinking of when we see kids in general uh, in our consulting rooms? So cow's milk or soy allergy is actually quite common. Uh, I don't have statistics off the top of my head, but it, it presents with constipation, um, may or may not present with um, some blood in the stools and fissures because of the, the hard stools. Um, but think about it as a really great Royal Kids Hospital um, patient handout for, for parents to follow. Uh, basically avoid it for a week, two weeks. If it's not helping, go straight back on it. Uh, and then trial kids back on milk again at some stage because the percentage of kids that just get better in that time and then unfortunately are kind of off dairy for a significant period of their life. Um, so trialling again at some later stage. Uh, celiac disease, hypothyroidism and high calcium are other things to consider and I'll talk about when we might be looking at investigating for those, which is not every kid. So history, I'll sort of breeze through this because I think we all do this quite well. Um, and you don't necessarily need a prompt from me to do better, but uh, think about the Rome 4 criteria. So on the previous page, so how often, um, how large is the poo that comes out? Does it block the toilet? How often are you going during the week? Um, are you having to strain? Um, is it really painful? Looking at the Bristol stool chart, which everyone has their own favourite version of, um, and asking them to, to classify and point to, to which is their normal one. Um, red flags, we'd go through those, we'd screen for common causes of organic pathology, so cow's milk or soy, um, and we feel wonderful when we can um, uh, diagnose that in a sense and fix constipation, which is um, rare. Um, looking at school practices as well, so some of those behavioural issues that might be leading to constipation, uh, and importantly, diet and fluid intake and toilet posturing, which we'll talk about a bit later. So examination, so we're um, looking again broadly. Um, so in most kids, you'd be thinking about doing a height and weight. Uh, you'd be doing a tummy exam, looking for hard stool. You might be looking for a um, distended bladder um, or other pathology that might make you concerned that this is a secondary cause and not necessarily behavioural. Uh, spine and sacrum, again, probably wouldn't look at this um, and happy to be corrected by other GPs, but I wouldn't necessarily look for this in other kids. Uh, if they've come at the age of three or four with constipation and they've been fine, they walk in well, they've got a normal gait and they're otherwise healthy. Uh, but for exam purposes and just to have in the back of your mind, thinking about spine and sacrum and, and neurological uh, examination as well. Um, and 
for examination purposes, um, thinking about uh, reviewing the perianal area, but I, again, wouldn't commonly be doing this in kids. Um, I'd definitely be asking mum, is there any concern? Has there been any blood in the stools? Um, is it painful for them when they go to the toilet? Um, and I'd offer to have a look. I would definitely not DRE. Um, and if mum or child don't want me to, then I will not. But happy to be corrected by any other GPs in the audience if they have a different approach. So management is really uh, disimpaction. Uh, if they have a significant issue and there's a really good kids hospital guideline in terms of how to um, how to start, how many um, sachets to go to and how often to do so. Um, so I refer you guys to that. And then maintenance, which we'll have a look at here. So I've pulled from a couple of different resources um, from the Sydney Kids Hospital uh, Program webinar and Royal Children's Hospital guidelines. So in kids less than one, colloxal drops. Uh, but again, I'd be referring these kids because um, it's more likely to be a congenital core or something else going on. Um, infants under 12 months. So um, thinking about Movacol already uh, as a common um, uh, treatment option. Uh, paraffin oil can also be used. And importantly, treating fishes uh, using some Vaseline or petroleum jelly uh, can help to um, help soothe the area. Warm baths as well, warm salt baths, and really trying to relax that sphincter. Um, so, yeah, so basically saying that Movacol um, is pretty much the number one option uh, used for kids as well as adults. It works very well to bring water to the bowel, um, to soften the stool itself and help, itself and help it to move slowly um, and peacefully through the bowel um, and out the other end. Um, and there's other options there that you can have a read of. So when do we think what about investigating? Yep. To, oh, sorry, just a, um, a comment, um, first of all, from Chris. He often does check to make sure there's a fissure or a fistula, just again with patient's consent. And I might say I do, because then it's good for the parents to be aware of why they're avoiding stalling because mm. it hurts, hurts so much. Um, and another comment was, um, not that I'm into drug companies, but... Um, um, one of the paraffin oils, um, Parachop, they've got these great little handout booklets mm. that have got stickers and and the kids really, especially like your five-year-olds that don't sit down for long enough and it's got a little stool reward chart on it. So I find that they get excited. They come back in a month with their stool chart, with their stickers. So mm. it's not for everyone, but that's a nice little resource as well. Yeah, it's really cool. I remember those. Do you guys remember those um, antibiotics that kids used to get and they had their monster stickers on it? Do you guys remember those? Yeah. Um, they are. Oh, they are. Yeah, I do. What brand it was? Yeah, <laughs> they were really cool as well for that same reason. I remember my sister got stickers and I didn't. Um, so yeah, parachock. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I was um, going to say, Em, I went to a um, talk with a gastro pediatric gastroenterologist years ago, and he was very much like it's not so only constipation, but it's particularly with kids with abdominal pain, which often coincides mm. with constipation. He was always like, you have to check the rectal area because okay. um, sometimes that's where you find the evidence of Crohn's like a fistula mm. or even a fissure I guess but um, yeah. so that was more so for the older kids where you got the abdominal pain um, and I think I was just gonna make it so the reason for parachock if I if I remember correctly not giving it as much under 12 months that's the aspiration risk isn't it that we worry about mm. I'm not entirely yeah. sure about that but I think something it's like yeah that. But yeah, I think I they think still use risk. it but it's like it's something to do with you certainly don't want to give it to a kid who can't swap it hasn't got it um, mature swallowing reflex and stuff. Um, I'd like to just add that um, I did. I, I agree with you about actually looking at the at the anal at the anus and seeing if there's any fissures or anything else. Um, but I did have a a parent who was very anxious when I did that, and I think so. I think it's quite good to explain. Mm. Uh, and the parent thought. You know that as I sort of pulled apart the skin just to look, there was a fissure, and she mm. thought I I might have created the fissure by doing that. Mm. So so it's it's good to explain it, I think, and uh, maybe that's where that kind of indication that you should be careful about the uh, DRE comes from too. That parents might get upset. Mm. No, that's great. Thanks, guys. And I think that's context. Um, and, and being safe as well, and, and the way we set up the examinations too. Oh, so that's great. So 
Um, so when might we think about uh, investigating kids um, further than just treatment? So basically, if they're failing treatment, um, it's a good time to think about other pathology, um, what we might be missing. So that's when we might think about starting bloods or doing some bloods. Um, I would think about doing um, a bowel chart from the beginning. Uh, it's a good way, um, as uh, Georgia mentioned, to kind of motivate kids to either stay on the Movicol or um, uh, it, because it can be a long process of uh, therapy uh, for some kids. And ultrasound, ultrasound of the rectal diameter is something that I'm using more and more um, in uh, recent months and, and actually works really nicely. Um, it doesn't have any radiation, as you know. Um, it's easily achieved at the, at the radiology centres uh, and it's a nice teaching tool as well for kids so they have an idea of what it is we're actually doing with treatment for the older kids that it can understand the process. Uh, it's something that can be repeated down the line as well um, to show that progress of, of, um, of constipation improvement. So can, can I just ask, I haven't yeah. used that. Um, how invasive is that? Is that literally just an ultrasound on the outside or? Yeah. Okay, sweet. Yeah, I've, I haven't used that at all. So it's really Yeah, it's so good and the kids love it and then you can talk about it. You can use videos after. Cool. Um, and that the caveat is if they have food within the last six hours, it can be smaller than it, than it would otherwise be. Um, so it can underestimate the size of the rectum, uh, but it's a really nice way to kind of show them what's actually happening um, for them and then mark that progress for future. Emily, so, are yeah, all places offering that, like all um, radiology places, um, or do they need to be a specialised? Like I know on the Central Coast there's one place in particular that's quite good with kids um, imaging. But, yeah. um, just... I, I refer to ACE across the road um, and that's where people have had it um, uh, bulk build and pretty quickly, um, yeah, just as a normal ultrasound. Um, other pathology companies I haven't referred to yet, but um, I think it's just a, um, a simple ultrasound on the top of the tummy um, to examine. And it nicely shows the indent in the bladder as well. Um, so pretty easy to access. I don't think you need any specific training for it. Um, and really, really nice. And just to recap, so in terms of why I would do it, um, can you? How, do, how does it change my management? So I've decided it's constipation. Yeah, what, what's its role in? Yeah, management? so um, so when do I use it? I probably use it um, in place of when I might have used an X-ray in the past to say, is this constipation? Is this something else? Um, so you can use it in that sense. Um, so they can also see fecal loading and excessive bowel gas and stuff like that that can help you um, decide that that's a common cause for, for tummy pain as well. Um, and it's also that motivator. So if you're kind of getting nowhere, you're talking to them, they do a little bit of Movicol, but they're not really consistent. They're not really into it. Parents don't think it's an issue. Um, that's when the ultrasound can also help because it's, it's something that is more objective um, instead of saying, oh, constipation is the reason why um they're getting tummy pain and um when you treat it it goes away but the ultrasound also shows that the rectum should be this size and it is this size um so it can be um basically in place of the x-ray um to help sort of uh diagnose uh but also as a motivator okay and then and but you're not suggesting serial ultrasounds though to see a reduction in that diameter no okay. no 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 so um i might do that for kids if if again it's been like a long kind of on Movicol, long time on Movicol, um, to sort of show that yes, things have improved and, and coming off it. Um, and again, more of as a motivator rather than um, something that needs to be repeated. Cool. Thanks, Em. Cool. And Ian's very excited because he's got an ultrasound machine, so he can't wait to use it. <laughs> the next child that walks through his door. Is nice. Be <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's actually a lot of fun. Like it, yeah, it's good. Um, so education, so I think is something as GPs that we do really well. Um, and constipation is no different in that sense. Um, so hopefully this video will work. It's a really good um, tool that you can give to your kids uh, and parents to use uh, outside of the room as homework and then come back and chat to you. So I'm just going to play a couple of minutes. I had sound and then I lost it.
exactly right. We'll come back to that video in a few minutes as well. Um, but basically, so over time, it's a really good tool to, to demonstrate to, to parents and kids alike that um, the, the process of what's happening and why it's important to um, potentially stay on low for coal uh, for a few weeks or a few months. So, and that's basically that overstretching the rectum by lots of stool sitting there, um, they're losing that trigger or the impetus in a sense to poo. So they're not necessarily sensing it as they would otherwise. Every time you hold back a poo, it actually sends it back up the rectum uh, and slows down the whole process. So things are kind of starting to slow again. So really important when they get that trigger uh, or that impetus to poo that they do uh, pay attention and go sit down on the toilet. Um, it causes harder stools because the colon is, is still absorbing water, um, becomes harder to push and just sets off that cycle. Um, and that's why it's important to, to keep on treatment. So uh, again, so how do we, again, educate parents about uh, the basics of how to poo? Uh, and I think there's a lot of this that um, I certainly didn't, didn't know before this talk and um, uh, it's going to change the way that I uh, talk to kids as well. So I'll play a couple more minutes of, of the video. And that's where we come in. So this is a really um, potentially confronting uh, quick picture in your face uh, about poo posture. Um, and a couple of articles I've seen um, are very much the same, except the person might be actually sitting up straight or might be bent forward. So I'd say that that would be um, personal. Uh, but uh, basically you can see that uh, a poo stool can really help um, relaxing the legs, bringing them up just slightly above above where the angle of the hips are or where the hips are, uh, relaxing the tummy. So letting it really hang out instead of holding it in, uh, leaning forward. And the idea being that we should actually not have to strain at all or push on the toilet and it should just come out um, using again, that kind of stimulus that the rectum is full, rectum is ready, ready to go to the toilet, uh, sit down in his posture and it should come out. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Our physio used to teach our medical students about pooing. They, uh, it was great, actually. Uh, the university ended up cancelling that because of inter-school financial flows or something. Mm. But um, but she said the 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 uh, the classic old-fashioned bloke who used to sit on the toilet yeah. bent forward reading the newspaper was the ideal uh, posture for doing a poo, and was something to do with engaging the appropriate muscles. Mm. So it is that leaning forward posture then that the leaning seems forward, more common. Yeah. Liked the leaning forward, yeah. No, that's good. And I, I think about sort of evolutionary, we wouldn't be sitting on toilets. So it sort of it makes sense to me as well that the posture of sitting on a seat is not the same as the one that needs to for us to go to the toilet. So um yeah, it makes sense, but I must admit I didn't necessarily think too much about it in the past. So that's really good. Uh, so we've got a really quick question uh, for you guys. So the gastrocolic reflex. Uh, so is it 20 minutes after meals, an hour post meals, 10 minutes after meals, and that's in three hours. And that's the one where you eat something, um, the gut gets the message that food is on its way, uh, and then it needs to transit the stool so that you can empty uh, and leave space for more. 
And if you don't feel like uh, committing to an answer in chat, just make sure I probably would say to commit to it either on, on your phone or writing it down so you've got an idea of what your thoughts are there. And if you get it wrong, then you kind of have that, that reminder. So the correct answer is 20 minutes, so 20 minutes after meals. So that's the ideal time to be telling kids. Uh, back from that video, it said morning, lunch and dinner after meals. Uh, 20, 20 minutes after is the ideal time uh, to make full use of the gastrocolic reflex. All right, another quick one. So for maintenance of soft stools, with or without proceeding disimpaction required for kids with functional constipation, treatment should be considered and continued for at least how many months? Six, one, three or two. So I just give you a couple of seconds to think. Oh, uh, so the answer is two months. So a lot longer than a lot of kids and families are using it for. Uh, and that might be, and again, the Royal Kids Hospital has a really nice uh, guide on, on using Ropicol and grading it up or down depending on the the consistency of the stool, um, but making sure that we're following up these kids regularly um, to help them with that process as well. When do we refer kids? So clearly if things aren't getting better, um, we've, we've thought about it, we've maybe done some investigations, it's not making sense, it's not getting better, then referring by about six months, if not before, if you're concerned. Um, and treatment might actually be required for a lot longer than the two months. Uh, so again, if you're concerned, referring on or phoning a friend. Uh, but having a look at that kids' hospital guideline because that's just fabulous. So again, so why so long? Why is treatment so long? Because again, we're we're trying to take the flabby, stretched, overstretched rectum and make it back into a um, elastic uh, type balloon in a sense. So it takes that process to really take the stress off off the rectum uh, and help it relax and come back to its normal size again, so that we can then um, benefit from what the rectum naturally does, which is tell us when to poo, tell us when it's full um, and to hold the stool um, uh, and not, not be a holding place as such, but help it to come out. So that's why it takes so long. So again, referring, another, another thing that I would commonly refer for or think about referring early is those kids that are incredibly distressed or parents incredibly distressed, um, not responding to care and then if you're concerned about an organic cause, of course. So this is a quick did you know um, to wake us up a little bit as well. Um, so when you hold a poo, um, so you don't listen to your gastrocolic reflex and you hold on and send it back up the line, it actually sends a signal to start slowing gastric transit. So it's sort of starting off to slow that entire process down. So really important to listen to the signal when it comes. Uh, that distension itself is that ready signal. So if kids are over distended, they're going to lose that signal. Uh, we talked before about... Um, Loxal drops, I think, in kids under one month, uh, where we'd be referring rather than necessarily treating because there might be a uh, congenital cause. But kids under six months can strain and cry before passing soft stools. Uh, and unless the stools are also hard, um, then it's usually not constipation and it will self-resolve. Uh, and just a kind of comment here as well, that autism spectrum disorder, kids with autism spectrum, or on the autism spectrum, sorry, um, or with ADHD, have an increased risk of functional constipation. So um, uh, thinking about, I think it's girls that aren't uh, as commonly diagnosed with ADHD um, and kids that present with constipation, having this in the back of your mind as to, you know, if it is a behavioural issue and your confidence behavioural issue, is there something else that's uh, potentiating that behavioural uh, component of constipation? And this is where I thought I'd stop for either questions or um, as GPs, I think we're often um, got lots of knowledge to share. So I was thinking this is a good time to either stop for questions or if someone had something else to add on anything up that we've mentioned so far. More just a comment, Emily. Just yeah, often when um, kids come in with you know abdominal pain and you ask 
um, about their stooling history. I oh, know they stool every day, but you suspect constipation, but the parents quickly dismiss it. I find that's yeah. When you delve in a bit further, um, you know, often you can find out that it is, you know, once you've excluded the other red, red, red and yellow flags, that it is constipation. But I must say, it is quite hard because they say, oh no, they poo every day, but you have to delve into it further. Like, are they big poos, and how long do they yeah. stay? <laughs> and do they block the toilet? Um, I had someone the other day um, be working with a, a girl who's sort of the the, um, the reason I was interested in this topic and to present it today and she's um, similar. So, you know, goes to the toilet every day. She's really regular. Sometimes she goes twice a day. But you actually look at her um, stool chart when she came back with it and it's lots of twos, lots of straining um, and pain as well. No, So no fissures but sort of has that, meets that criteria for having some of those things on there. Uh, on the Rome criteria so and again her ultrasound showed dilated rectum and she'd been having bladder issues so it kind of just helped set up that process and then in history mum was like oh hang on a second so her brother's on the toilet and we can hear him from two rooms away straining and pushing do you think he's got constipation as well um, so again it's something that is incredibly common uh, but it, we don't necessarily see it as a problem um, so it's important to, to screen for it and ask those questions. And we've got two other questions. So, Ian? Oh, yes, I've got to rethink, uh, and it maybe relates to adults uh, and then now applying all this to children, but there was an international study where they uh, asked people how often they, they, they had a poo, and mm. interestingly, the average for white uh, Europeans was uh, two to three days Apparently, the Bulgarians won with uh, their average being three to five days. Mm. Uh, and so this idea that you've got to have a poo every day uh, mm. is compounded by, you know, perhaps old fashioned parents uh, who used to give castor oil every Sunday to the family to make sure that, uh, um, you know, that they were regular and everything like that. And so this, there's this sort of pressure from, you know, history and grandparents and things like this to make you go every day and, and that's got it seems to be have its own set of problems as opposed to just you know letting the whole thing just work naturally so i'd mm. be interested in your comments on, on those things oh i completely agree i completely agree and it comes back to that the opposite end of the spectrum where kids say that or parents say they're going every day but they've still got constipation so what's normal for one person is not normal for the next person um and it comes back to you know is it a large volume stool is it painful um is it on that that one side of the bristol stool chart um does it cause fissures does it block the toilet that kind of stuff um and is it an issue for them as well so again kind of knowing that everyone's normal is is different to someone else's normal so completely agree and thanks for bringing that up yeah. um and jeremy had a question too i won't put my video up because i'm driving still but um uh, I've moved away completely pretty much from Overcoal um, to using Osmolax instead, which is still Macrogol, whatever number it is, um, uh, but without the electrolytes, because you can mix it into anything. Um, and that makes things a lot, right, lot easier to be able to get it into kids on a regular basis. You're a muted <laughs> Oh, no, that's good. Thanks for that, Jeremy. Um, I like recommending the chocolate Movacol. I think that goes down a lot better than the other ones that can taste gross. But that's really good. All right, can so. I, can I make a self-care comment? Mm. Um, uh, last night I was in a meeting where one of the GPs was very quiet, a Zoom meeting at 8 p.m. And at the end she said she hadn't eaten or drunk anything all day. Mm. And I know myself, when I have a really busy day, I work um, most of the day on Saturday and there's lots of fit-ins and emergencies and stuff. Um, uh, I, I end up quite constipated um, the next day. So I think uh, we need to look after ourselves as well and make sure at least we get some fluids into us. Mm. I was really worried about her. She just looked so stressed and so tired. Mm. And, so, so true. I know that's not kids, but it's appropriate to talk about it in this venue, I think. Yeah, yeah so true. Um, Emma, I was just going to make a comment. Um, Kelly made a really good point in the um, chat 
uh, around having seen an ED doctor palpate uh, a child's abdomen uh, and there was obviously some fecal loading there and they were able to feel the fecal loading and that made a real difference for the patient mm. to be able to feel it and go, oh, okay, that's what it is. And I just yeah. wanted to reinforce that around that um, the amount of times I've sat in on consults and, and no one's actually examined the child, no one's put hands on the stomach and how important yeah. that is to actually put your hands on the patient, examine their abdomen, you know, Without doing that, I just don't know how you can do a proper consult for this to rule out red flags and so forth. So I think just that reinforcement yeah. of the need for physical, because we omit it a lot in general practice, and I think it's an important skill that we're all losing. So Yeah, and clearly I'm, I haven't been doing enough looks at bottoms, so I'm definitely adding <laughs> that back in. Um, but tummy exam is essential. Um, yeah, totally. It's um, It'd miss a lot, but it's also like the ultrasound. It kind of is that key to... To demonstrating what's going on and it's also really nice because then they can self-check and they're like oh it's really hard oh but I didn't think I was oh okay um so yeah really really um good All right, so I might move on for time um looking at the time so we're going to breeze through we uh, problems in the day and in the night um and we've got some really quick questions I'm going to run through so why couldn't police officers catch the toilet thief because they had nothing to go on um, and doctor, doctor, I think I have a bladder infection. Uh, I see you're in trouble. Um, so really corny, uh, but hopefully, again, sort of helps us keep kids in mind. Uh, so definitions for we uh, and abnormal leakage. So monosymptomatic tends to be um, urinary leakage that is um, primarily associated with nighttime leaking or, or nighttime wetting, uh, but it's usually one symptom, um, either day or night. Non-monosymptomatic is day and night wetting. Uh, primary is it's always been a problem and secondary is it's been a problem it's been previously fine um, for six months or more and then they've started wetting again at either day or night um, and that's a really important distinction to make because uh, it, it aligns itself with different causes uh, and different treatments so when someone comes to us with pee issues um, in history we're looking at is it daytime daytime and nighttime has it always been a problem or has it just started after the last six months have been fine? Other history in weeing is actually um, nicely aided by this um, by the bladder diary, um, which is some, which is a tool that you can give um, kids to get um, more history out of them. Because I don't know about you guys, but if you have kids that are eight to eight to sort of twelve year olds, uh, they don't really give you a lot of history, uh, and the parents might actually not know a lot about their their uh, bladder control in this age either. So. Um, this is um, pinched from the Incontinence um, Australia website uh, and it's a two-page document, part of a two-page document that you can give to kids as a handout. So on our history, we're looking at um, how often are they going to the toilet, um, how big of a volume if they leak, um, what's happening around that time. So this is probably more daytime, um, but what's happening around the time that they're leaking? Uh, is there urgency involved? Is it a large amount coming out? Is it a little amount coming out? What time of the day is it happening? Um, how does it relate to the fluid that they're drinking? Are they drinking lots of caffeinated drinks? Are they not drinking much at all? Um, so they have a, potentially a small bladder volume. Um, are they fluid restricting? Uh, and what's their bowel function like? So this is a really good um, reminder for us when we're taking a history of daytime uh, wedding, especially um, as to what the components are to that history. Um, other things we're thinking about in history uh, are our red flags. So these are really, um, again, that secondary um, secondary wedding, which is um, acute change. So is this uh, caused by an infection or recurrent infections? Um, is it uh, some jumping to some of these? Sorry, they're not necessarily in order, but is, is there another organic cause for it? So um, diabetes or uh, behavioural problems, sleep apnea. Uh, well, something that's not on here, or actually it's right at the end, is that vulnerable child, which is really important to mention. So it can be a sign of uh, sexual abuse in a kid uh, if they've previously been dry and then start to wet again uh, during the day or during the night. Uh, so it's something really important to think about in the back of your mind uh, and consider in these presentations. So some of the other things to think about uh, and red flags can be daytime symptoms. So um, Daytime and nighttime wetting might be an indicator that there's more of a primary pathology uh, related to the bladder itself um, or potentially an under underlying behavioural issue that we need to get to the bottom of. Are uh, they drinking excessively and is that related to another um, another pathology? Um, and then 
uh, jumping down to family history. So there's lots of things to consider in, in red flags, and it mainly is that that population around secondary um, causes for the week uh, for wetting. So we wouldn't necessarily go into all this history if it's a primary um, uh, problem, but um, definitely keeping these in the back of your mind. Uh, so other history, so again, kind of looking at those, uh, the context around the kit. Um, so the pattern that we get uh, by assessing the bladder diary, uh, the bowel habit, importantly, look for getting that, and the sleeping arrangements in the family. So where does the kid sleep? Are they sleeping um, in a quiet room? Are they sleeping in a noisy room? Are they sleeping with siblings or parents? What's the sleeping arrangements like? Uh, so examination, again, I won't labour this point, but... Um, Again, doing a really good exam, height, weight, so checking if there's any organic pathology. Um, again, are they not growing appropriately? Is there something else we need to consider? Uh, doing a blood pressure or thinking about a blood pressure in these kids just to check, again, that uh, link with kidney uh, kidney dysfunction. Uh, doing abdominal exam, again, assessing for the same things we were potentially with constipation presentations. Um, genitalia, lower back and spine, thinking about neurological causes potentially um, in these kids. So investigations, and again, we'll jump in a second to primary and secondary, but these are the investigations that pretty much follow any presentation or we need to be thinking about them. Uh, so they're not necessarily recommended, but I'd be doing a UA. It's easy enough to do in the rooms. It's easy enough to send off an MSU. And I think if the parents come to us with an issue, they've tried to deal with it at home uh, and it's something we don't want to miss, um, whether an infection or sugar or uh, protein in the urine, really quick to pick up. So I would probably be routinely doing or considering an MSU. Uh, ultrasound is also readily accessible, um, easy and fun to fun for kids to do um, most of the time. Um, and importantly, putting on that post void residual, which is what is going to help us to diagnose some of those secondary causes or daytime causes as well. Um, bladder diary. So I don't know about you guys, but I think, again, I don't necessarily get a lot of good history. Um, out of parents or kids when they first present. So the bladder diary itself can be that window into what's happening. And it really is the key to, to a lot of the time solving the issue. The ultrasound and the MSU often come back normal. You don't get much history and stuck. Uh, the bladder diary is something that is really, really important to help you help them. Uh, and when we get the bladder diary, so these numbers can be readily accessible on the Royal Kids Hospital website again. So some of the things we're looking at when we're, um, we've got that bladder diary, that magical bladder diary back, is the expected maximum avoided volume. So, um, and there's the formula there. So basically, if we get, we're looking at a bladder diary and the kid is having urgency at 30 mils, uh, at 50 mils, um, and they're waiting to completion, then that's more of an indication of potentially overactive bladder. Um, if they're comfortably holding and they're, they're releasing a, a good amount, then that shows us they've got a good bladder volume, good bladder size, um, and that, that that is happening normally. So again, it's a really nice way of, um, I don't know, I, I just find this part of medicine cool because you can actually um, diagnose a lot of issues um, and, based and on can this. Can I just, sorry, you might have already said this and I missed it. The, um, what's your spiel to the patient on how to actually measure this urine? That's like the practicality of doing this. Yeah, good question. I, I kind of say, look, it, it is labour intensive. Um, it is a bit yucky, um, but really, really important. And choose a couple of days when you're home. So whether that's a quiet weekend at home, whether that's school holidays coming up, uh, which is what one of my kids is doing, which is cool. Um, but it's those couple of days when you're at home. Um, it's not easy to do otherwise. And then again, trying to make it fun for the kid. So some kind of reward or stickers or whatever it is, um, but trying to make it fun for the kid um, because it, and, and, and again, just sort of, I think majority of the time it's the parent you're probably selling it to because they're the one that's doing the hard work. Um, so really trying to sell the, the diagnostic value of this bladder diary um, and potentially alleviating the, the issue for the kid. I think. And it totally makes sense. I, I think even just that idea, of how do you catch the urine? How do because you, you've got to have a quite an engagement yeah. <laughs> to put an ice cream container or something and then get a measuring yeah. thing. And yeah, it's um like I think it's really important. It's just that practical. How do you get the parent to actually measure that accurately? Mm. Um, yeah, so the ice cream container is great. Get a cheap um, 
Uh, yeah, measuring jug or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's all it's these extra steps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah don't use yeah. it for a corner later. <laughs> don't stick it back in the kitchen. Um, cool. And then there's another one, another vol um, formula there for looking at how much urine is too much urine to make overnight, which might be an indication of um, reduced ADH secretion. Um, so quick question. So we're talking about leakage, but what actually, what age do we start to, to think about it might be an issue? So when should it normally resolve is the question here. So um, three years, four years, five years or six years. Uh, so five is years. Gender come into this M? Yeah, it, it doesn't actually, but I think oh, that boys, it. yeah, I think boys do tend to have more issues from memory. Um, yeah, that's is that what everyone, yeah. A bit later sometimes. But yeah, but the articles, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think they tend to have more issues. So their, their set point might be different, but articles are saying sort of five years is the, the time in mind. But it's important to kind of keep in mind, and I might skip to the next page, that even though we're kind of saying that five years is the time where we, things should start to normalise, it's not until the age of six that we're really starting to, to kind of get involved in helping kids and families with this issue. Um, and that's, again, because most kids will um, resolve their issues themselves in that time. Uh, but obviously, if parents are coming to you, um, going through that, that really good history, looking for red flags, um, and thinking about other reasons why um, they might be presenting. But sort of the age of six is when we, we'd start to consider treatment. So we've got 10 minutes to run through daytime wedding. Um, so I'll skip through some of these. So bladder diary, bladder diary, bladder diary. Um, this is probably the money money slide, and it is a bit busy. Um, the top, most, top four probably common causes for daytime wedding in kids um, is either voiding postponement, so that's when they present with the wee dance. They start fluid restricting and they get an urgency to wee and they might go to the, vault, the toilet three times or less. Um, and that can really be helped by um, education with parents and kids. Um, so whether that's getting a fun watch involved or something like that, but making them to sit down on the toilet um, to empty their bladder regularly. And again, you're trying to, much like constipation, where they've lost that that signal to empty, uh, it's kind of reteaching them that signal to empty when they get um, get the urge. Uh, constipation is a common cause as well um, and then overactive bladder. So how do we pick this up? So we might pick it up with the kids on the, the bladder volume, the bladder, uh, what am I trying to say, the bladder diary uh, chart uh, when they've got urgency and they wet. Um, frequency, so these kids might be going quite frequent and not have necessarily a large output when they do go. Um, they might have a small, small bladder capacity and we can use that formula to find that out. Um, it's usually associated with constipation and irritability, but important irritability of the bladder. But importantly, um, there's no postfoid residual in that ultrasound. Um, and treatment here is something that I would probably be referring for, um, uh, but there are options there for kids as well. Um, vaginal reflux is incredibly common um, in um, more of the prebubertal um, girls. Um, so that would be a presentation where they're saying, I go to the toilet and I wet a few minutes after getting off the toilet and it's just a small amount. So it might be a few drops in the undies, uh, but it's enough to sort of sit there and make them smell through the day and, and just make life a bit miserable. So uh, again, the bladder diary uh, will help to, to delineate that and the ultrasound should be normal. There's a really nice uh, picture on the net as well where you can show the urine going up to the vagina as well and sitting there before they come out. So it really is treated by either straddling the toilet, so spreading your legs apart to open, open the labia um, and help that urine flow out instead of refluxing back up the vagina or sitting on the toilet if they're not comfortable to straddle it backwards and separating their legs quite far apart. And they should grow out of that, so they shouldn't have to do that for life. Um, Palakiuri I don't know too much about, but... It's one of those causes I don't think I've ever seen, but excessive daytime wedding often caused by stress and it is self-limiting apparently. Um, so reassurance, but if someone presented with excessive daytime frequency, I'd be definitely going through the red flags um, and thinking urine infection or something else. Uh, giggle incontinence is where instead of just that, um, uh, it's not stress incontinence in these kids. So it's when they actually void to completion when they laugh. Um, so 
treatment for that is pelvic floor training and preparation. So they need to kind of brace themselves before they laugh. Um, and that often can help. Um, dysfunctional voiding, I won't labour because of time, but basically it's that everything's contracting at once. And you might see that on the ultrasound by having a large post void residual um, and a large, um, a large void volume. So again, common causes of this are constipation and poor learning, but there can be neurological causes as well. Um, so thinking about referring these kids if they've got that large post void residual. Um, and then this is just my reminder for you guys that uh, the kids hospital says that we should be um, uh, consulting the, the PEDS team uh, before we're starting some of these treatments in especially younger kids. So true or false, uh, most common treatment for daytime urinary incontinence is behaviour modification. Uh, so true. So nighttime really quickly. Um, so nighttime wetting um, is uh, also considered, um, I don't know officially or not, but talked about as part of one of the sleep disorders. Um, so um, I think importantly for nighttime wetting, uh, one of the most important things, if I can impart, is basically normalising it for the kids um, and explaining it in a way where it's it's not their fault, it's not because they're trying or wanting to wet the bed um, and it's something that their body is doing and we can help them with we can help them with that reflex and retraining um, so what causes it so it can be bladder size which can be um, small because of genetics or constipation itself limiting that that full extension of the bladder bladder dysfunction uh, or because they're they're not taking enough fluid in uh, urine volume itself can be affected by what they're drinking um, which can cause problems sleep arousal um, so if they have a sleep disorder such as obstructive um, sleep apnea um, or developmental delay, um, they can also have difficulties waking uh, when they need to go to the toilet. And then thinking about secondary causes again. So looking at those red flags, uh, and if they've been dry for over six months, thinking about psychosocial causes um, or other organic pathology. So management is nice and simple. So in everyone looking at the bowel, um, because it's such a common player in everything that's happening with the, the bladder. So thinking about the bowel, doing that bladder diary that has a section there for the bowel and stools as well. Normalising and educating, really, really important. Um, and it, it's definitely one of those things that can help empower kids. And there was a really nice podcast um, that I haven't included in resources, but it's on um, the ABC podcast, Parental Is Anything. Um, and it talks about bedwetting and she nicely says that no one brags about wetting the bed. So no one's going to go to school and say, guess what I did last night? Um, but it's incredibly common. Um, so normalising it to kids, talking about it with kids so they don't feel uh, as targeted or um, problematic because uh, it can be a really stressful time for families. Uh, urotherapy is really important for all kids. So making sure they're getting enough fluids in. So they're well hydrated, making sure their bladder capacity is at capacity and not small. Uh, which will cause issues in, in and of itself, um, regular voiding and voiding posture as well. Uh, treating the daytime symptoms before tackling the night. And with nighttime, it's basically the bedwetting alarm and then uh, plus or minus desmopressin. So bedwetting alarms. So um, the kids' hospital actually has a link, um, if you type it in, um, to a list of service providers near you. It has some really neat videos on how to use it um, and how to troubleshoot some of the issues when it's not working for parents. Um, there is also um, a lot of pharmacies, I think, also sell the devices. There's the body worn ones in the underpants um, and there's the ones that go um, on the outside um, or on the bed itself. There's wireless options as well. Um, and it's just a reminder here that it's not suitable if there's significant distress in the family um, because it's just going to cause more problems um, and disrupted sleep. So they're the kids you'd be thinking about other options. Um, so once dryness is achieved, again, with the bedwetting alarm, it's important to do something or think about something called overloading, which is basically giving the kid a couple of extra drinks at night time. So you're basically, it's, it's like the super test for the bladder. So once they've passed, they've been dry for, um, dry for a while, for, for two weeks or more, then you kind of give their bladder an extra challenge. Um, and hopefully they, again, if things are set, then they wake at night. And that's really important because then they can otherwise go back to wetting um, easily, I think, if they don't do this overloading activity. 
and some kids. So we trial this for about, I think, eight to 12 weeks, I think they say. Um, but um, if it's not working too much distress, stop it, start again another time. Um, so why does it fail? Uh, so it can fail because kids wait, fail to wake. So um, it's just not enough for some kids that are deep sleepers um, who, are the, who, who have other sleeping disorders. Um, so they might fail to wake to the alarm itself. Um, they might wake, but they don't want to get out of bed. So again, it's not kind of retraining that um, or stopping that. So actually teaching the parent to get out of bed with the kid to go to the toilet. Um, and I can't imagine how much of a pain it would be for that period of time. Um, but that's really important. Um, the alarm itself can have issues. Um, the, the kid can be wearing thick pyjamas so the urine's absorbed, uh, not reaching the pad in time um, and not using it long enough. So a couple more slides and we're finished. Um, so basically reasons why you might be thinking about the melt. Um, and I'd probably refer you back to the kids' hospital just because of time, resources, for more information about how to use that and when. Um, I think it's indicated only when they've trialled bedwetting alarm and that's failed, uh, but really good for like school camps and staying overnight, things like that to really help with kids' uh, self-esteem. So referring uh, when kids have got red flags, um, they failed the alarm potentially, um, you're worried about an organic cause um, and substantial psychological distress. So a couple of quick tips. So triple or double making the bed. So when kids are waiting overnight, parents are waking up having to make the bed again or remake the bed. So talking to them about double or triple making the bed so at night they don't have to get everything out of the cupboard and make it again. They just have to take off a layer. Um, can be a much easier process. Um, again, how common it is. Um, and that there is a National Continence Helpline, which I didn't realise either, um, but it's eight to eight weekdays. Um, there's an interpreter service attached to it as well. Uh, it's a free service um, and it's patients to call. Um, so um, you can refer patients to this if they have issues with their bed and pad alarm. Um, and it's at a time when they're not able to come in and see you someone who can talk to them, who understands what they're going through. Um, and it's not only for kids, this continence line, it's for, for adults and older patients as well for their issues with their bladder or continence issues. So really, really cool. Um, and the next slide I think is the what do they cover when you call them um, so they can help with all sorts of things. So a really good resource to pass on to patients um, to show them that they're not alone in this and there is help out there for them whenever they need if they're not coming in to see us at those vital times. So when you hold back a poo, you send it back up the line and it slows everything down. So go when you get the signal. Um, and I thought I'd, I can't spell, but right at the end, it's meant to be constipation. It uh, can actually be one of the first signs of Parkinson's as well. So when kids are presenting with constipation, whether we think it's functional or not, thinking about those other causes, um, in kids thinking about autism potentially or ADHD, um, in adults thinking about is there something else as well going on. All right, and that's where got to the fast end of that hour thanks guys for sitting through hopefully you all came away with at least something um and um yeah enjoy this topic because it's actually kind of fun talking about pee and poo with kids i think we got so many take-home messages not just one i'm walking away with many that was amazing oh. emily so good yeah and i like i like pee and poo talk as well so yeah. i just to make sure You're on mute, Georgia. Now, I just quickly mentioned, um, uh, Jeremy mentioned some a good resource on the Royal Children's Hospital website that gives you that percentage breakdown that can be reassuring, like what you mentioned. Um, and Chris also mentioned um, yeah, for supervisors, the GPSA has got great teaching resources on um, nocturnal enuresis as well as many others. So great, that was amazing. Oof. Thank you, I love learning with you guys. So it's nice to get that feedback and that those comments are out too. That was great. And the slideshow was certainly very professional. It's um, lovely to see what uh, the younger generation can do with a PowerPoint.
<laughs> uh, thanks everybody uh, for coming and I will send out the flyer um, over the next couple of days. Don't forget that we all have to register now. It's a little bit different to what we were doing before. So you just have to click on to Eventbrite and register and then I'll send you um, the link for the meeting in another fortnight. All right. Thanks everybody and have a great day. Thanks guys. All right, I think that's just us, Georgia. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying Jenny was there. Did she stop the recording? No, I think Jenny must have jumped off. No, the recording still going. Um, I don't know if there's a way I can stop that. Or if, I think. Uh, just have a look. Turn off incoming. No, I don't think we have access to that. No, no, I can't see it. Cool. An amazing session. An amazing session. Yeah, amazing well, session. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess I'll talk to you the next meeting. Yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah. No worries, Chris. Thanks, talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.